Welcome to Classics You Slept Through. My name is Meredith Davis, and this is the first read-aloud episode of The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. I'll be reading to you from the beginning of chapter one through the middle of chapter two. Here we go. Chapter one, The Metamorphosis. When Gregor Samsa woke up one morning from unsettling dreams, he found himself changed in his bed into a monstrous vermin. He was lying on his back as hard as an armor plate, and when he lifted his head a little, he saw his vaulted brown belly sectioned by arch-shaped ribs to whose dome the cover, about to slide off completely, could barely cling. His many legs, pitifully thin compared with the size of the rest of him, were waving helplessly before his eyes. What's happened to me? He thought. It was no dream. His room, a regular human room, only a little on the small side, lay quiet between the four familiar walls. Over the table, on which an unpacked line of fabric samples was all spread out, Samsa was a traveling salesman, hung the picture which he had recently cut out of a glossy magazine and lodged in a pretty gilt frame. It showed a lady done up in a fur hat and a fur boa, sitting upright and raised up against the viewer a heavy fur muff in which her whole forearm had disappeared. Gregor's eyes then turned to the window and the overcast weather. He could hear raindrops hitting against the metal window ledge. Completely depressed him. How about going back to sleep for a few minutes and forgetting all this nonsense, he thought. But that was completely impractical, since he was used to sleeping on his right side, and in his present state, he could not get into that position. No matter how hard he threw himself onto his right side, he always rocked onto his back again. He must have tried it a hundred times, closing his eyes so as not to see his squirming legs, and stopped only when he began to feel a slight dull pain in his side, which he had never felt before. Oh God, he thought, what a grueling job I've picked. Day in, day out on the road, the upset of doing business is much worse than the actual business in the home office. And besides... I've got the torture of traveling, worrying about changing trains, eating miserable food at all hours, constantly seeing new faces. No relationships that last or get more intimate. To the devil with all of it. He felt a slight itching up on top of his belly, shoved himself slowly on his back, closer to the bedpost, so as to be able to lift his head better. Found the itchy spot, studded with small white dots, which he had no idea what to make of, and wanted to touch the spot with one of his legs, but immediately pulled it back, for the content sent a cold shiver through him. He slid back again into his original position. This getting up so early, he thought, makes anyone a complete idiot. Human beings have to have their sleep. Other traveling salesmen live like harem women. For instance, when I go back to the hotel before lunch to write up the business I've done, these gentlemen are just having breakfast. That's all I'd have to try with my boss. I'd be fired on the spot. Anyway, who knows if that wouldn't be a very good thing for me. If I didn't hold back for my parents' sake, I would have quit long ago. I would have marched up to the boss and spoken my piece from the bottom of my heart, and he would have fallen off the desk. It is funny, too, the way he sits on the desk and talks down from the heights to the employees, especially when they have to come right up close on account of the bosses being hard of hearing. Well, I haven't given up hope completely. Once I've gotten the money together to pay off my parents' debt to him, that will probably take another five or six years, I'm going to do it without fail. Then I'm going to make the big break. But for the time being, I'd better get up since my train leaves at five and he looked over at the alarm clock, which was ticking on the chest of drawers. God almighty, he thought. It was 6.30. The hands on the clock were quietly moving forward. It was actually past the half hour. It was already nearly a quarter to. Could it be that the alarm hadn't gone off? You could see from the bed that it was correctly set for four o'clock. It certainly had gone off too. Yes, but was it possible to sleep quietly through a ringing that made the furniture shake? Well, He certainly hadn't slept quietly, but probably all the more soundly for that. But what should he do now? The next train left at seven o'clock. To make it, he would have to hurry like a madman, and the line of samples wasn't packed yet, and he himself didn't feel especially fresh and ready to march around. And even if he did make the train, he could not avoid getting it from the boss because the messenger boy had been waiting at the five o'clock train and would have long ago reported as not showing up. He was a tool of the boss, without brains or backbone. What if he were to say he was sick? But that would be extremely embarrassing and suspicious, because during his five years with the firm, Gregor had not been sick even once. 
The boss would be sure to come with the health insurance doctor, blame his parents for their lazy son, and cut off all excuses by quoting the health insurance doctor for whom the world consisted of people who were completely healthy but afraid to work. And besides, in this case, would he be so very wrong? In fact, Gregor felt fine, with the exception of his drowsiness, which was really unnecessary after sleeping so late, and he even had a ravenous appetite. Just as he was thinking all this over at top speed, without being able to decide to get out of bed, the alarm clock had just struck a quarter to seven. He heard a cautious knocking at the door next to the head of his bed. Gregor, someone called. It was his mother. It's a quarter to seven. Didn't you want to catch the train? What a soft voice. Gregor was shocked to hear his own voice answering, unmistakably his own voice true, but in which, as if from below, an insistent distressed chirping intruded, which left the clarity of his words intact only for a moment, really, before so badly garbling them as they carried that no one could be sure if he had heard right. Gregor had wanted to answer in detail and to explain everything, but, given the circumstances, confined himself to saying, "'Yes, yes, thanks, mother, I'm just getting up.' The wooden door must have pre prevented the change in Gregor's voice from being noticed outside, because his mother was satisfied with this explanation and shuffled off. But their little exchange had made the rest of the family aware that, contrary to expectations, Gregor was still in the house, and already his father was knocking on one of the side doors, feebly, but with his fist. Gregor! Gregor! he called. What's going on? And after a little while, he called again in a deeper warning voice. Gregor! Gregor! And at the other side door, however, his sister moaned gently, Gregor, is something the matter with you? Do you want anything? Toward both sides, Gregor answered, I'm all ready, and made an effort by meticulous pronunciation and by inserting long pauses between individual words to eliminate everything from his voice that might betray him. His father went back to his breakfast, but his sister whispered, Gregor, open up, I'm pleading with you. But Gregor had absolutely no intention of opening the door and complimented himself instead on the precaution he had adopted from his business trips of locking all the doors during the night, even at home. First of all, he wanted to get up quietly, without any excitement, get dressed, and the main thing, have breakfast. And only then think about what to do next, for he saw clearly that in bed he would never think things through to a rational conclusion. He remembered how in the past he had often felt some kind of slight pain, possibly caused by lying in an uncomfortable position, which, when he got up, turned out to be purely imaginary, and he was eager to see how today's fantasy would gradually fade away. That the change in his voice was nothing more than the first sign of a bad cold, an occupational ailment of the traveling salesman, he had no doubt in the least. It was very easy to throw off the cover. All he had to do was puff himself up a little, and it fell off by itself. But after this, things got difficult, especially since he was so unusually broad. He would have needed hands and arms to lift himself up, but instead of that, he had only his numerous little legs, which were in every different kind of perpetual motion, and which, besides, he could not control. If he wanted to bend one, the first thing that happened was that it stretched itself out, and if he finally succeeded in getting this leg to do what he wanted... All the others, in the meantime, as if set free, began to work in the most intensely painful agitation. Just don't stay in bed being useless, Gregor said to himself. First, he tried to get out of bed with the lower part of his body. But this lower part, which, by the way, he had not seen yet, and which he could not form a clear picture of, proved too difficult to budge. It was taking so long. And when finally, almost out of his mind, he lunged forward with all his force, without caring, he had picked the wrong direction and slammed himself violently against the lower bedpost, and the searing pain he felt taught him that exactly the lower part of his body was, for the moment anyway, the most sensitive. He therefore tried to get the upper part of his body out of bed first, and warily turned his head toward the edge of the bed. This worked easily, and in spite of its width and weight, the mass of his body finally followed, slowly, the movement of his head. But when at last he stuck his head over the edge of the bed into the air, he got too scared to continue any further, since if he finally let himself fall in this position, it would be a miracle if he didn't injure his head. And just now he had better not, for the life of him, lose consciousness. He would rather stay in bed. But when, once again, after the same exertion, he lay in his original position, sighing, and again watched his little legs struggling, and 
if possible, more fiercely with each other, and saw no way of bringing peace and order to this mindless motion, he again told himself that it was impossible for him to stay in bed, and that the most rational thing was to make any sacrifice for even the smallest hope of freeing himself from the bed. But at the same time, he did not forget to remind himself occasionally that thinking things over calmly, indeed as calmly as possible, was much better than jumping to desperate decisions. At such moments, he fixed his eyes as sharply as possible on the window, but unfortunately, there was little confidence and cheer to be gotten from the view of the morning fog, which surrounded even the other side of the narrow street. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself as the alarm clock struck again. Seven o'clock already, and still such a fog. And for a little while, he lay quietly, breathing shallowly, as if expecting, perhaps, from the complete silence the return of things to the way they really and naturally were. But then he said to himself, Before it strikes quarter past seven, I must be completely out of bed without bail. Anyway, by that time someone from the firm will be here to find out where I am, since the office opens before seven. And now he started rocking the complete length of his body out of the bed with a smooth rhythm. If he let himself topple out of bed in this way, his head, which on falling he planned to lift up sharply, would presumably remain unharmed. His back seemed to be hard. Nothing was likely to happen, it, happen to it when he fell onto the carpet. His biggest misgivings came from his concern about the loud crash that was bound to occur and would probably create, if not terror, at least anxiety behind all the doors. But that would have to be risked. When Gregor's body already projected halfway out of the bed, the new method was more of a game than a struggle. He only had to keep on rocking and jerking himself along. He thought how simple everything would be if he could get some help. Two strong persons, he thought of his father and the maid, would have been completely sufficient. They would only have to have shoved their arms under his arched back and in this way scoop him off the bed, bend down with their burden, and then just be careful and patient while he managed to swing himself down onto the floor where his little legs would hopefully acquire some purpose. Well, leaving out the fact that the doors were locked, should he really call for help? In spite of all his miseries, he could not repress a smile at this thought. He was already so far along that when he rocked more strongly, he could hardly keep his balance. Very soon, he would have to commit himself, because in five minutes, it would be a quarter past seven, when the doorbell rang. "'It's someone from the firm,' he said to himself, and almost froze, while his little legs only danced more quickly. For a moment, everything remained quiet. "'They're not going to answer,' Gregor said to himself, captivated, captivated by some senseless hope. But then, of course, the maid went to the door as usual, with her firm stride and opened up. Gregor had only to hear the visitor's first word of greeting to know who it was, the office manager himself. Why was only Gregor condemned to work for a firm where at the slightest omission they immediately suspected the worst? Were all employees louts without exception? Wasn't there a single loyal, dedicated worker among them who, when he had not fully utilized a few hours of the morning for the firm, was driven half mad by pangs of conscience and was actually unable to get out of bed? Really, wouldn't it have been enough to send one of the apprentices to find out? If this prying were absolutely necessary, did the manager himself have to come? Did the whole innocent family have to be shown in this way that the investigation of the suspicious affair could be entrusted to only the intellect of the manager? And more as a result of the excitement produced in Gregor by these thoughts than a result of any real decision, he swung himself out of bed with all his might. There was a loud thump, but it was not a real crash. The fall was broken a little by the carpet, and Gregor's back was more elastic than he had thought, which explained the not very noticeable muffled sound. Only he had not held his head carefully enough and hit it. He turned it and rubbed it on the carpet in anger and pain. Something fell in there, said the manager in the room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine whether something like what had happened to him today could one day happen to even the manager. He really had to grant the possibility. But as if in rude reply to this question, the manager took a few decisive steps in the next room and made his patent leather boots creak. From the room on the right, his sister, his sister whispered to inform Gregor, Gregor, the manager is here. I know, Gregor said to himself, but did not dare raise his voice enough for his sister to hear. Gregor, his father now said from the room on the left, the manager has come and wants to be informed why you didn't catch the early train. We don't know what we should say to him. Besides, he wants to speak to you personally, so please, open the door. He will certainly be so kind as to excuse the disorder of the room. Good morning, Mr. Samsa, 
the manager called in a friendly voice. There's something the matter with him, his mother said to the manager while his father was still at the door talking. Believe me, sir, there's something the matter with him. Otherwise, how would Gregor have missed the train? That boy has nothing on his mind but the business. It's almost begun to rile me that he never goes out nights. He's been back in the city for eight days now, but every night he's been home. He sits there with us at the table, quietly reading the paper or studying times tables. It's already a distraction for him when he's busy working with his fret saw, for instance. In the span of two or three evenings, he carved a little frame. You'll be amazed how pretty it is. It's hanging inside his room. You'll see it right away when Gregor opens the door. You know, I'm glad that you've come, sir. We would have never gotten Gregor to open the door by ourselves. He's so stubborn. And there's certainly something wrong with him, even though he said this morning that there wasn't. I'm coming right away, said Gregor slowly and deliberately, not moving in order to miss a word of conversation. I haven't any other explanation myself, said the manager. I hope it's nothing serious. On the other hand, I must say that we businessmen, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever you prefer, very often simply have to overcome a slight indisposition for our business reasons. So can the manager come in now, asked his father, impatient, and knocked on the left door again. No, said Gregor. In the room on the left, there was an embarrassing silence. In the room on the right, his sister began to sob. Why didn't his sister go into the others? She had probably just got out of bed and not even started to get dressed. Then what was she crying about? Because he didn't get up and didn't let the manager in? Because he was in danger of losing his job and because the boss would start hounding his parents about the old debts? For the time being, certainly, her worries were unnecessary. Gregor was still here and hadn't the slightest intention of letting the family down. True, at the moment he was lying on the carpet and no one knowing his condition could seriously have expected him to let the manager in. But just because of this slight discourtesy, for which an appropriate excuse would easily be found later on, Gregor could not simply be dismissed. And to Gregor it seemed much more sensible to leave him alone now than to bother him with crying and persuasion. But it was just this uncertainty that was tormenting the others and excused their behavior. "'Mr. Samsa,' the manager called now, raising his voice, "'what's the matter? You barricade yourself in your room, answer only yes and no, cause your parents serious, unnecessary worry, and you neglect, I mention this only in passing, your duties to the firm in a really shocking manner.' I am speaking here in the name of your parents, and of your employer, and ask you in all seriousness for an immediate, clear explanation. I'm amazed, amazed. I thought I knew you to be a quiet, reasonable person, and now you suddenly seem to want to start strutting about flaunting strange whims? The head of the firm did suggest to me this morning a possible explanation for your tardiness. It concerned the cash payments recently entrusted to you? But really... I practically gave my word of honor that this explanation could not be right. But now, seeing your incomprehensible obstinacy, I am about to lose even the slightest desire to stick up for you in any way at all. And your job is not the most secure. Originally, I intended to tell you all this in private, but since you make me waste my time here for nothing, I don't see why your parents shouldn't hear too. Your performance of late has been very unsatisfactory. I know it is not the best season for doing business, we all recognize that, but a season for not doing any business? There is no such thing. Mr. Samsa, such a thing cannot be tolerated. But sir, cried Gregor, beside himself in his excitement for getting everything else, I'm just opening up in a minute. A slight indisposition, a, a dizzy spell, prevented me from getting up. I'm still in bed, but I already feel fine again. I'm just getting out of bed. Just be patient for a minute. I'm not as well as I thought yet, but really I'm fine. How something like this could just take a person by surprise? Only last night I was fine. My parents can tell you. Or wait, last night I already had a, a slight premonition. There must have been, they must have been able to tell by looking at me. Why didn't I report it to the office? But you always think that you'll get over a sickness without staying home. Sir, spare my parents. There's no basis for any of the accusations that you're making against me now. No one has ever said a word to me about them. Perhaps you haven't seen the last orders I sent in. Anyway, I'm still going on the road with an eight o'clock train. These few hours of rest have done me good. Don't let me keep you, sir. I'll be at the office right away. And so be as kind to tell them that tell them this and, and give my respects to the head of the firm. And while Gregor hastily blurted all of this out, hardly knowing what he was saying, he had easily approached the chest of drawers, probably as a result of the practice he had already gotten in bed, and now he tried to raise himself up against it. 
He actually intended to open the door, actually present himself and speak to the manager. He was eager to find out what the others, who were now so anxious to see him, would say at the sight of him. If they were shocked, then Gregor had no further responsibility and could be calm. But if they took everything calmly, then he, too, had no reason to get excited and could, if he hurried, actually be at the station by eight o'clock. At first, he slid off the polished chest of drawers a few times, but at last, giving himself a final push, he stood upright. He no longer paid any attention to the pains in his abdomen, no matter how much they were burning. Now he let himself fall against the back of a nearby chair, clinging to its slats with his little legs. But by doing this, he had gotten control of himself and fell silent, since he could now listen to what the manager was saying. "'Did you understand a word?' the manager was asking his parents. He isn't trying to make fools of us, is he? My God, cried his mother already in tears. Maybe he's seriously ill, and here we are torturing him. Greta, Greta, she then cried. Mother, called his sister from the other side. They communicated by way of Gregor's room. Go to the doctors immediately. Gregor is sick. Hurry, get the doctor. Did you just hear Gregor talking? That was the voice of an animal said the manager, in a tone conspicuously soft compared with the mother's yelling. Anna! Anna! the father called through the foyer into the kitchen, clapping his hands. Get a locksmith right away! And already the two girls were running with rustling skirts through the foyer, how could this sister have gotten dressed so quickly, and tearing open the door to the apartment. The door could not be heard slamming. They had probably left it open, as is the custom in homes where great misfortune has occurred. But Gregor had become much calmer. It was true that they no longer understood his words, though they had seemed clear to, enough to him. Clearer than before, probably because his ear had grown accustomed to them. But still the others now believed that there was something the matter with him, and were ready to help him. The assurance and confidence with which the first measures had been taken did him good. He felt ingratiated into human society once again, and hoped for marvelous, amazing feats from both the doctor and the locksmith, without really distinguishing sharply between them. In order to make his voice as clear as possible for the crucial discussions that were approaching, he cleared his throat a little, taking pains, of course, to do so in a very muffled manner, since this noise, too, might sound different from human coughing, a thing he no longer trusted himself to decide. In the next room, meanwhile, everything had become completely still. Perhaps his parents were sitting at the table with the manager, whispering. Perhaps they were all leaning against the door and listening. Gregor slowly lugged himself toward the door, pushing the chair in front of him, then let go of it, threw himself against the door, held himself upright against it, the pads on the bottom of his legs exuded a little sticky substance, and for a moment rested there from the exertion. But then he got started, turning the key in the lock with his mouth. Unfortunately, it seemed that he had no real teeth. What was he supposed to grip the key with? But in compensation, his jaws, of course, were very strong, with their help, he actually got the key moving and paid no attention to the fact that he was undoubtedly hurting himself in some way, for a brown liquid came out of his mouth, flowed over the key, and dripped onto the floor. Listen, said the manager in the next room, he's turning the key. It was a great encouragement to Gregor, but everyone should have cheered him on, his father and mother too. Go, Gregor, they should have called. Keep going! At that lock, harder, harder! And in the delusion that they were all following his efforts with suspense, he clamped his jaws madly on the key with all the strength he could muster. Depending on the progress of the key, he danced around the lock, holding himself upright only by his mouth. He clung to the key as the situation demanded, or pressed it down again with the whole weight of his body. The clearer click of the lock as it finally snapped back literally woke Gregor up. With a sigh of relief, he said to himself, oh, So I don't need the locksmith after all and laid his head down on the handle, in order to open wide one wing of the double doors. Since he had to use this method of opening the door, it was really opened very wide while he himself was still invisible. He had to edge slowly around the one wing of the door, and do so very carefully if he was not to fall flat on his back just before entering. He was still busy with this difficult maneuver, and had no time to pay attention to anything else when he heard the manager burst out loud with an, Oh! It sounded like a rush of wind, and now he could see him, standing closest to the door, his hand pressed over his open mouth, slowly backing away, as if repulsed by an invisible, unrelenting force. His mother, in spite of the manager's presence, she stood with her hair still unbraided from the night, sticking out in all directions, 
first looked at his father with her hands clasped, then took two steps toward Gregor and sank down in the midst of her skirt spreading out around her, her face completely hidden on her breast. With a hostile expression, his father clenched his fist as if to drive Gregor back into his room, then looked uncertainly around the living room, shielded his eyes with his hands, and sobbed with heaves of his powerful chest. Now Gregor did not enter the room after all, but leaned against the inside of the firmly bolted wing of the door, so that only half his body was visible, and his head above it, cocked to one side and peeping out at the other's. In the meantime, it had grown much lighter. Across the street, one could see clearly a section of the endless, grayish-black building opposite. It was a hospital, with its regular rectangular windows starkly piercing the facade. The rain was still coming down, but only in large, separately visible drops that were also pelting the ground literally one at a time. The breakfast dishes were laid out lavishly on the table, since for his father breakfast was the most important meal of the day, which he would prolong for hours while reading various newspapers. On the wall directly opposite hung a photo of Gregor from his army days, in a lieutenant's uniform, his hand on his sword, a carefree smile on his lips, demanding respect for his bearing and his rank. The door to the foyer was open, and since the front door was open too, it was possible to see out onto the landing and the top of the stairs going down. Well, said Gregor, as he was thoroughly aware of being the only one who had kept calm. I'll get dressed right away, pack up my samples and go. Will you, will you please let me go? Now, sir, you see, I'm not stubborn, and I'm willing to work. Traveling is a hardship, but without it I couldn't live. Where are you going, sir? To the office? Yes. Will you give an honest report of everything? A man might find for a moment that he was unable to work, but that's exactly the right time to remember his past accomplishments and to consider that later on, when the obstacle has been removed, he's bound to work all the harder and more efficiently. I'm under so many obligations to the head of the firm, as you know very well. Besides, I also have my parents and my sister to worry about. I'm in a tight spot, but I'll also work my way out again. Don't make things harder for me than they already are. Stick up for me in the office, please. Traveling salesmen aren't very well liked there, I know. People think they make a fortune leading the gay life. No one has any particular reason to rectify this prejudice. But you, sir, you have a better perspective on things than the rest of the office. An even better perspective, just between the two of us, than the head of the firm himself, who, in spite of his capacity as owner, easily lets his judgment be swayed against an employee. And you also know very well that the traveling salesman who is out of the office practically the whole year round can so easily become the victim of gossip, coincidences, and unfounded accusations against which he is completely unable to defend himself, since in most cases he knows nothing at all about them except when he returns, exhausted from a trip, and back home gets to suffer on his own person the grim consequences, which can no longer be traced back to their causes." Sir, don't go away without a word to tell me you think that I'm at least partly right. But at Gregor's first words, the manager had already turned away and with curled lips looked back at Gregor only over his twitching shoulder. And during Gregor's speech, he did not stand still for a minute, but, without letting Gregor out of his sight, back toward the door, yet very gradually, as if there were some secret prohibition against leaving the room. He was already in the foyer, and from the sudden movement with which he took his last step from the living room, one might have thought he had just burned the sole of his foot. In the foyer, however, he stretched his right hand far out toward the staircase, as if nothing less than an unearthly deliverance were awaiting him there. Gregor realized that he must on no account let the manager go away in this mood if his position in the firm were not to be just jeopardized in the extreme. His parents did not understand this too well. In the course of the years, they had formed the conviction that Gregor was set for life in this firm. And furthermore, they were so preoccupied with their immediate troubles that they had lost all consideration for the future. But Gregor had this forethought. The manager must be detained, calmed down, convinced, and finally won over. Gregor and the family's future depended on it. If only his sister had been there. She was perceptive. She had already begun to cry when Gregor was still lying calmly on his back. And certainly the manager, this lady's man, would have listened to her. She would have shut the front door and in the foyer talked him out of his scare. But his sister was not there. Gregor had to handle the situation himself. And without stopping to realize that he had no idea what his new faculties of movement were, and without stopping to realize either that his speech had probably, indeed probably, had not been understood again, he let go of the wing of the door, 
he shoved himself through the opening, intending to go to the manager, who was already on the landing, ridiculously holding onto the banister with both hands, but groping for support. Gregor immediately fell down with a little cry onto his numerous little legs. This had hardly happened when, for the first time that morning, he had a feeling of physical well-being. His little legs were firm on the ground. They obeyed him completely, as he noted to his joy. They even strained to carry him away wherever he wanted to go, and he already believed that final recovery from all his sufferings was imminent. But at that very moment, as he lay on the floor rocking with repressed motion, not far from his mother and just opposite her, she who had seemed so completely self-absorbed, all at once jumped up, her arms stretched wide, her fingers spread, and cried, Help! For God's sakes, help! Held her head bent, as if to see Gregor better, but inconsistently darted madly backward instead, had forgotten that the table laden with the breakfast dishes stood behind her, sat down on it hastily, as if her thoughts were elsewhere, when she reached it, and did not seem to notice at all that near her the big coffee pot had been knocked over and coffee was pouring in a steady stream onto the rug. "'Mother! Mother!' Gregor said softly, and looked up at her. For a minute, the manager had completely slipped his mind. On the other hand, at the sight of the spilling coffee, he could not resist snapping his jaws several times in the air. At this, his mother screamed once more, fled from the table, and fell into the arms of his father, who came rushing up to her. But Gregor had no time now for his parents. The manager was already on the stairs, with his chin on the banister. He was taking a last look back. Gregor was off to a running start, to be sure as possible of catching up with him. The manager must have suspected something like this, for he leaped down several steps and disappeared. But he still shouted, Ah! And the sound carried through the whole staircase. Unfortunately, the manager's flight now seemed to confuse his father completely, who had been relatively calm until now. For instead of running after the manager himself, or at least not hindering Gregor in his pursuit, he seized in his right hand the manager's cane, which had been left behind on a chair with his hat and overcoat, picked up in his left hand a heavy newspaper from the table, and stamping his feet, started brandishing the cane and the newspaper to drive Gregor back into his room. No plea of Gregor's helped. No plea was even understood, however humbly he might turn his head. His father merely stamped his feet more forcefully. Across the room, his mother had thrown open a window in spite of the cool weather, and leaning out, she buried her face far outside the window in her hands. Between the alley and the staircase, a strong draft was created. The window curtains blew in. The newspaper on the table rustled. Single sheets fluttered across the floor. Pitilessly, his father came on, hissing like a wild man. Now Gregor had not any practice at all, walking in reverse. It was really very slow going. If Gregor had only been allowed to turn around, he could have gotten into his room right away, but he was afraid to make his father impatient by this time-consuming gyration, and at any minute the cane in his father's hand threatened to come down on his back or his head with a deadly blow. Finally, however, Gregor had no choice, for he noticed with horror that in reverse he could not even keep going in one direction, and so incessantly throwing uneasy side glances at his father, he began to turn around as quickly as possible, in reality turning only very slowly. Perhaps his father realized his good intentions, for he did not interfere with him. Instead, he even now and then directed the maneuver from afar with the tip of his cane. If only his father did not keep making this intolerable hissing sound, it made Gregor lose his head completely. He had almost finished the turn when, his mind continually on the hissing, he made a mistake and even started turning back around to his original position. But when he had, at last, successfully managed to get his head in front of the open door, it turned out that his body was too broad to get through it as it was. Of course, in his father's present state of mind, it did not even remotely occur to him to open the other wing of the door in order to give Gregor enough room to pass through. He had only the fixed idea that Gregor must return to his room as quickly as possible. He would never have allowed the complicated preliminaries Gregor needed to go in through in order to stand up on one end and, perhaps, in this way, fit through the door. Instead, he drove Gregor on, as if there were no obstacle, with exceptional loudness. The voice behind Gregor did not sound like that of only a single father. Now this was really no joke anymore, and Gregor forced himself, come what may, into the doorway. One side of his body rose up, he lay lopsided on the opening, and one of his flanks was scraped raw. Ugly blotches marred the white door. Soon he got stuck, and could not have budged any more by himself. His little legs on one side dangled trembling in midair, 
Those on the other were painfully crushed against the floor, when from behind his father gave him a hard shove, which was truly his salvation, and bleeding profusely, he flew far into his room. The door was slammed shut with the cane, then, at last, everything was quiet. First half of chapter two. It was already dusk when Gregor awoke from his deep, coma-like sleep. Even if he had not been disturbed, he certainly would not have woken up much later, for he felt that he had rested and slept long enough, but it seemed to him that a hurried step and a cautious shutting of the door leading to the foyer had awakened him. The light of the electric street lamps lay in pallid streaks on the ceiling and on the upper parts of the furniture, but underneath, where Gregor was, it was dark. Groping clumsily with his antenna, which he was now only beginning to appreciate, he slowly dragged himself toward the door to see what had been happening there. His left side felt like one single long, unpleasantly tautening scar, and he actually had to limp on his two rows of legs. Besides, one little leg had been seriously injured in the course of the morning's events. It was almost a miracle that only one had been injured, and dragged along lifelessly. Only after he got to the door did he notice what had really attracted him the smell of something to eat. For there stood a bowl filled with fresh milk, in which a small slices of bread were floating. He could almost have laughed for joy, since he was even hungrier than he had been in the morning, and he immediately dipped his head into the milk, almost over his eyes. But he soon drew back again in disappointment, not only because he had difficulty eating on account of the soreness in his left side, and he could only eat if his whole panting body cooperated, but because he didn't like milk at all. Although, it used to be his favorite drink, and that was certainly why his sister had put it in his room. In fact, he turned away from the bowl, almost with repulsion, and crawled back to the middle of the room. In the living room, as Gregor saw through the crack in the door, the gas had been lit. But while at this hour of the day his father was in the habit of reading in the afternoon newspaper in a loud voice to his mother and sometimes to his sister too, now there wasn't a sound. Well, perhaps this custom of reading aloud, which his sister was always telling him and writing him about, had recently been discontinued altogether. But in all the other rooms, too, it was just as still, although the apartment certainly was not empty. What a quiet life the family has been leading, Gregor said to himself, and while he stared rigidly in front of him into the darkness, he felt very proud that he had been able to provide such a life in so nice an apartment for his parents and his sister. But what now if all the peace the comfort, the contentment, were to come to a horrible end. In order to not get involved in such thoughts, Gregor decided to keep moving, and he crawled up and down the room. During the long evening, first one of the side doors and then the other was opened a small crack and quickly shut again. Someone had probably had the urge to come in and then had had, had second thoughts. Gregor now settled into position right by the living room door, determined somehow to get the hesitating visitor to come in, or at least to find out who it might be. But the door was not opened again, and Gregor waited in vain. In the morning, when the doors had been locked, everyone had wanted to come in. Now that he had opened one of the doors, the others had evidently been opened during the day, no one came in, and now the keys were even inserted in on the outside. It was late at night when the light finally went out in the living room, and now it was easy for Gregor to tell that his parents and his sister had stayed up so long since, as he could distinctly hear, all three were now retiring on tiptoe. Certainly no one would come in to Gregor until the morning, and so he had ample time to consider, undisturbed, how best to rearrange his life. But the empty high ceiling room in which he was forced to lie flat on the floor made him nervous, without his being able to tell why, since it was, after all, the room in which he had lived for the past five years, and turning half unconsciously and without a slight feeling of shame, he scuttled under the couch where, although his back was a little crushed, he could not raise his head any more, he immediately felt comfortable and was only sorry that his body was too wide to go completely under the couch. There he stayed the whole night, which he spent partly in a sleepy trance, from which hunger pangs kept waking him with a start, partly in worries and vague hopes, all of which, however, led to the conclusion that, for the time being, he would have to lie low, and by being patient and showing his family every possible consideration, help them bear the inconvenience which he simply had to cause them in this present condition. Early in the morning, it was still almost night, Gregor had the opportunity of testing the strength of the resolutions he had just made, for his sister, almost fully dressed, opened the door from the foyer and looked in eagerly. She did not see him right away, but when she caught sight of him under the couch, God, he had to be somewhere, he couldn't just fly away, she became so frightened that she lost control of herself and slammed the door shut again. But, as if she felt sorry for her behavior, 
She immediately opened the door again and came in on tiptoe, as if she were visiting someone seriously ill, or perhaps even a stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward just to the edge of the couch and was watching her. Would she notice that he left the milk standing, and not because he hadn't been hungry, and would she bring him a dish and something he liked better? If she were not going to do it of her own free will, he thought he would rather starve than call it to her attention. Although, really, he felt an enormous urge to shoot out from under the couch, throw himself at, her sister, at his sister's feet, and beg her for something good to eat. But his sister noticed at once, to her astonishment, that the bowl was still full. Only a little milk was spilled around it. She picked it up immediately, not with her bare hands, of course, but with a rag, and carried it out. Gregor was extremely curious to know what she would bring him instead, and he racked his brain on the subject. But he would never have been able to guess what his sister, in the goodness of her heart, actually did. To find out his likes and dislikes, she brought him a wide assortment of things, all spread out on an old newspaper. Old, half-rotten vegetables, bones left over from the evening meals, caked with congealed white sauce, some raisins and almonds, a piece of cheese, which two days before Gregor had declared inedible, a plain slice of bread, a slice of bread and butter, and one with butter and salt. In addition to all this, she put down some water in the bowl, apparently permanently earmarked for Gregor's use. And out of a sense of delicacy, since she knew that Gregor would not eat in front of her, she left hurriedly and even turned the key just so that Gregor should know that he might make himself as comfortable as he wanted. Gregor's legs began worrying now that he was going to eat. Besides, his bruises must have completely healed, since he no longer felt any handicapped, and marveling at this, he thought how over a month ago he had cut his finger very slightly with a knife, and how this wound was still hurting him only the day before yesterday. Have I become less sensitive? he thought, already sucking greedily at the cheese, which had immediately and forcibly attracted him ahead of all the other dishes one right after the other, and with eyes streaming with tears of contentment, he devoured the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh fruits, on the other hand, he did not care for. He couldn't even stand their smell and drag the things he wanted to eat a bit farther away. He had finished everything long since and was just lying lazily at the same spot when his sister slowly turned the key as a sign for him to withdraw. That immediately startled him, although he was almost asleep, and he scuttled under the couch again. But it took great self-control for him to stay under the couch, even for the short time his sister was in the room, since his body had become a little bloated from the heavy meal, and in his cramped position he could hardly breathe. In between slight attacks of suffocation, he watched with bulging eyes as his unsuspecting sister took a broom and swept up, not only his leavings, but even the foods which Gregor had left completely untouched, as if they too were no longer usable, and dumping everything hastily into a pail, which she covered with a wooden lid, she carried everything out. She hardly turned her back when Gregor came out from under the couch, stretching and puffing himself up. This, then, was the way Gregor was fed each day, once in the morning, when his parents and the maid were still asleep, and a second time in the afternoon, after everyone had had dinner, for then his parents took a short nap again, and the maid could be sent out by his sister on some errand. Certainly they did not want him to starve either, but perhaps they would not have been able to stand knowing any more about his meals than from hearsay, or perhaps his sister wanted to spare them even what possibly was only a minor torment, for really, they were suffering enough as it was. Gregor could not find out what excuses had been made to get rid of the doctor and the locksmith on that first morning, for since the others could not understand what he said, it did not occur to any of them, not even to his sister, that he could understand what they said, and so he had to be satisfied when his sister was in the room, with only occasionally hearing her sigh and appeal to the saints. It was only later on, when she had begun to get used to everything— there could never, of course, be any question of a complete adjustment, that Gregor sometimes caught a remark which was meant to be friendly, or could be interpreted as such. Oh, he liked what he had today, she would say when Gregor had tucked away a good helping, and in the opposite case, which gradually occurred more and more frequently, she used to say almost sadly, Ah, oh, he's left everything again. But if Gregor could not get any news directly, he overheard a great deal from the neighboring rooms, and as soon as he heard voices, he would immediately run to the door concerned and press his whole body against it. Especially in the early days, there was no conversation that was not somehow about him, if only implicitly. For two whole days, there were family consultations at every meal time about how they should cope. This was also the topic of discussion between meals, for at least two members of the family were always at home, since no one probably wanted to stay at home alone, and it was impossible to leave the apartment completely empty.
Besides, on the very first day the maid, it was not completely clear what and how much she knew of what had happened, had begged his mother on bended knees to dismiss her immediately. And when she said goodbye a quarter of an hour later, she thanked them in tears for the dismissal, as if for the greatest favor that had ever been done to her in this house, and made a solemn vow without anyone asking her for it not to give anything away to anyone. Now his sister, working with her mother, had to do the cooking too. Of course, that did not cause her much trouble, since they had hard, since they hardly ate anything. Gregor was always hearing one of them pleading in vain with one of the others to eat, and getting no answer except, thanks, I've had enough, or something similar. They did not seem to drink anything, either. His sister often asked her father if he wanted any beer, and gladly offered to go out to get it for herself. And when he did not answer she said in order to remove any hesitation on his part that she could also send the janitor's wife to get it but then his father finally answered with a definite no and that was the end of that in the course of the very first day his father explained the family's financial situation and prospects to both the mother and the sister from time to time he got up from the table to get some kind of receipt or notebook out of the little strong box he had rescued from the collapse of his business five years ago Gregor had heard him open the complicated lock and secure it again after taking out what he had been looking for. These explanations, by his father, were to some extent the first pleasant news Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had always believed that his father had not been able to save a penny from the business, at least his father had never told him anything to the contrary, and Gregor, for his part, had never asked him any questions. In those days, Gregor's sole concern had been to do everything in his power to make the family forget as quickly as possible the business disaster which had plunged everyone into a state of total despair. And so, he had begun to work with special ardor and had risen almost overnight from stock clerk to traveling salesman, which, of course, had opened up very different money-making possibilities. And in no time, his successes on the job were transformed, by means of commissions, into hard cash that could be plunked down on the table at home in front of his astonished and delighted family. Those had been wonderful times, and they had never returned, at least not with the same glory, although later on Gregor earned enough money to meet the expenses of the entire family and actually did so. They had just gotten used to it, the family as well as Gregor. The money was received with thanks and given with pleasure, but no special feeling of warmth went with it any more. Only his sister had remained close to Gregor, and it was his secret plan that she, who, unlike him, loved music and could play the violin movingly, should be sent next year to the conservatory, regardless of the great expense involved, which could surely be made up for in some other way. Often during Gregor's short stays in the city, the conservatory would come up in his conversations with his sister, but always merely as a beautiful dream which was not supposed to come true, and his parents were not happy to hear even those innocent illusions. But Gregor had very concrete ideas on the subject, and he intended solemnly to announce his plan on Christmas Eve. Thoughts like these, completely useless in his present state, went through his head as he stood glued to the door listening. Sometimes out of general exhaustion he could not listen any more and let his head bump carelessly against the door, but immediately pulled it back again, for even the slight noise he made by doing this had been heard in the next room and made them all lapse into silence. What's he carrying on about in there now? said his father after a while, obviously turning toward the door, and only then would the interrupted conversation gradually be resumed. Gregor now learned in a thorough way, for his father was in the habit of often repeating himself in his explanations, partly because he himself had not dealt with these matters for a long time, partly, too, because his mother did not understand everything the first time around, that in spite of all their misfortunes, a bit of capital, a very little bit, certainly, was still intact from the old days, which, in the meantime, had increased a little through the untouched interest. But besides that, the money Gregor had brought home every month, he had kept only a few dollars for himself, had never been completely used up, and had accumulated into a tidy principle. Behind his door, Gregor nodded emphatically, delighted at this unexpected foresight and thrift. Of course, he actually could have paid off more of his father's debt to the boss with his extra money, and the day on which he could have gotten rid of his job would have been much closer but now things were undoubtedly better the way his father had arranged them. Now this money was by no means enough to let the family live off the interest. The principal was perhaps enough to support the family for one year, or at the most two, but that was all there was. So it was just a sum that really should not be touched, and that had to be put away for rainy days. But the money to live on would have to be earned. Now, his father was still healthy, certainly, but he was an old man who had not worked for the past five years, and who in any case could not be expected to undertake too much, 
During these five years, which were the first vacation of his hard-working yet unsuccessful life, he had gained a lot of weight, and as a result had become fairly sluggish. And was his old mother now supposed to go out and earn money when she suffered from asthma? When a walk through the apartment was already an ordeal for her? And when she spent every other day lying on the sofa under the open window, gasping for breath? And was his sister now supposed to work, who for all her seventeen years was still a child, and whom it would be such a pity to deprive of the life she had led until now, which had consisted of wearing pretty clothes, sleeping late, helping in the house, enjoying a few modest amu amusements, and above all, playing the violin? At first, whenever their conversation turned to the necessity of earning money, Gregor would let go of the door and throw himself down on the cool leather sofa which stood beside it, for he felt hot with shame and grief. Often he lay there the whole long night through, not sleeping a wink and only scrabbling in the leather for hours on end. Or, not balking at the huge effort of pushing an armchair to the window, he would crawl up to the windowsill and, propped up in the chair, lean against the window, evidently in some sort of remembrance of the feeling of freedom he used to have from looking out the window. For, in fact, from day to day he saw things, even a short distance away, less and less distinctly. The hospital opposite, which he used to curse because he saw so much of it, was now completely beyond his range of vision. And, if he had not been positive that he was living in, on Charlotte Street, a quiet but very still much like a city street, he might have believed that he was looking out of his window into a desert, where the grey sky and the grey earth were indistinguishably fused. It took his observant sister only twice to notice that his armchair was standing by the window for her to push the chair back to the same place by the window each time she had finished cleaning the room. And from then on, she even left the inside casement of the window open. If Gregor had only been able to speak to his sister and thank her for everything she had to do for him, he could have accepted her services more easily. As it was, they caused him pain. Of course his sister tried to ease the embarrassment of the whole situation as much as possible, and as time went on, she naturally managed it better and better. But in time, Gregor too saw things much more clearly. Even the way she came in was terrible for him. Hardly had she entered the room than she would run straight to the window without taking time to close the door, though she was usually so careful to spare everyone the sight of Gregor's room, then tear open the window casements with eager hands, almost as if she were suffocating, and remain for a little while at the window even in the coldest weather, breathing deeply. With this racing and crashing, for she frightened Gregor twice a day, the whole time he cowered under the couch, and yet he knew very well that she would certainly have spared him this if only she had found it possible to stand being in a room with him with the window closed. One time, it must have been a month since Gregor's metamorphosis, and there was certainly no particular reason any more for his sister to be astonished at Gregor's appearance. She came a little earlier than usual and caught Gregor still looking out the window, immobile and so in an excellent position to be terrifying. It would not have surprised Gregor if she had not come in, because his position prevented her from immediately opening the window. But not only did she not come in, she even sprang back and locked the door. A stranger might easily have thought that Gregor had been lying in wait for her, wanting to bite her. Of course, Gregor immediately hid under the couch, but he had to wait until noon before his sister came again, and she seemed much more uneasy than usual. He realized from this that the sight of him was still repulsive to her, and was bound to remain repulsive to her in the future and that she probably had to overcome a lot of resistance not to run away at the sight of even the small part of his body that jutted out from under the couch. So, to spare her even this sight, one day he carried the sheet on his back to the couch. The job took four hours, and arranged it in such a way that he was now completely covered up, and his sister could not see him even when she stooped. If she had considered this sheet unnecessary, then of course she could have removed it, for it was clear enough that it could not be for his own pleasure that Gregor shut himself off altogether. But she left the sheet the way it was, and Gregor thought that he had even caught a grateful look when one time he cautiously lifted the sheet a little with his head in order to see how his sister was taking the new arrangement. This ends the reading of the first half of The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Tune in for the next episode when we have a discussion on what we've just read, and thanks for joining us on Classics You Slept Through. <laughs>